at the sound of the flying clipper ship bells. A new shape has made its appearance at Pan American's international gateways. In New York and London, Brussels and Frankfurt, the Orient and Honolulu, Los Angeles and San Francisco, the new double-decked clipper has gone into service. There's no doubt about this plane. She's the world's finest commercial airliner, a million and a half dollar package wrapped in aluminum, one of a great fleet that is now flying for Pan American Airways. Moving across the field, she seems to be proud of her size and power. 110 feet, four inches from stem to stern, she's built to cruise at more than 300 miles an hour with a range of 4,200 miles. Her broad wings, 141 feet, three inches from tip to tip, will lift her higher than any other liner, almost five miles above the Earth into the stratosphere. Even at rest, she seems to take command, dwarfing everything else on the field. Loading her up for a flight, 10,000 pounds of luggage and cargo can be stacked in two lower deck compartments, while food for more than 70 people is taken on through a special hatch in the galley. These particular guests will travel like first-class passengers in an air-conditioned cargo hold. While baggage is being stored away on one side of the clipper, her passengers are checked through to the loading ramp on the other side, on their way to a new experience in luxury flight. Before she has even left the ground, you begin to notice the difference. The twin-decked spaciousness designed for more than just elbow room. Even now, you sense the sturdiness and solid dependability that will carry you into the air. She's ready to warm up now, and a field generator moves in to start her four great engines. From the pilot's parlor, one of the largest airline cockpits ever designed, the plane's crew directs and coordinates the work on the ground. Every instrument has been checked and double-checked, and finally the engineer calls ground from engineer, ready to start number three. Number four. Number two. Number one. Co-pilot gets the go-ahead signal by radio from the field control tower, and the big plane is set to move.
On the runway, she turns her huge body into the wind and begins to stretch her muscles. The clipper is on her own now. Clipper to tower. Flight 100, ready to take off. The flight tower gives her the final OK, and she starts to build up the power in her wings. Her wing flaps reach out, feeling the wind and ready to control its currents. Finally, the men at the controls are ready to take her off, and 142,000 pounds starts down the runway. She really begins to feel her strength now, mastering the air with the lift of her immense wings, the 14,000 horsepower combination of her four engines, more power than it takes to drive a locomotive or an ocean liner. In a matter of seconds, the airport and the city fall away beneath her, and she points out across the water, the plane that will set standards in air travel for years to come. For Pan American World Airways, this plane is the latest step in a long, pioneering tradition. A list of Pan American clippers reads almost like a history of commercial aviation, beginning in 1927 with the first American plane in international overseas service, the three-engine Fokker F-7. A year later, the S-38 was pioneering Caribbean routes, and by 1931, the Commodore flying boat carrying mail and passengers, had forged a link between the continents of North and South America. Taking the first steps in overseas transport, Pan American was bringing the peoples of the world to each other's doorsteps. By 1934, the airline was crossing new global boundaries. The S-42, first known as the Brazilian Clipper, surveyed the routes across the Pacific Ocean that Pan American was soon to fly. Before long, this plane would also lead the way across the Atlantic, bringing us one step closer to the dream of large-scale, inexpensive international transportation. On November 22, 1935, the M-130, the great China clipper, began the first scheduled airline flight across the Pacific to the Orient. Pan American Airways was reaching around the world. Soon the four-engine Boeing-built 307 went into operation with a special talent for long-range, high-altitude flying. To bridge the continents of the world, the luxurious Boeing 314 flew the airline's new transoceanic routes. The Douglas DC-4 was pressed into international service to carry Pan American's wartime load. And to share the post-war clipper routes with Lockheed's Constellation. And now, this double-decked giant masterpiece takes on the family name, joining the great fleet of Pan American Clippers. Her own history shows how well she qualifies as a thoroughbred. That history, 
began in Seattle, Washington, the home of the Boeing Airplane Company. Here, one day in 1944, Boeing's top flight engineers sat down with their opposite numbers from Pan American to talk about a new plane. Not just any plane. They wanted something special. A commercial liner that would combine passenger comfort with the engineering advances of Boeing's great military ships. The B-17, the great flying fortress. The B-29 super fortress. And later, the C-97 and the B-50, the first plane to fly non-stop around the world. These were to form the heritage of the plane they wanted. That day, the airline and the manufacturer became partners in an idea, and the new plane was sent to the drawing boards. These men had the job of transferring dreams into diagrams, a process of trial and error, correction and adjustment that was to use up six million square feet of blueprint before they were done. Finally, after a year's work, every specification had been thought out to the finest detail. The plane had been pinned down on paper, and the first stage was completed. They had a concrete aim now, and the job ahead was one of building and testing and building again. Before any big construction was started, a scale model of the new plane was set up in Boeing's wind tunnel to face the terrific velocity of man-made winds. Here, the future clipper would receive a thorough checkup. Under flight condition stresses, her performance could be predicted. With figures taken from the complex instrument panel, her basic structure could be tested and revised until she was perfect. Fan on. We're going up to test speed. Seven hundred and twenty hours in the wind tunnel determined her final shape. Now each section of her great body was put to the test separately. Locked in a cold chamber, her engines had to prove themselves at temperatures far below anything they might meet in flight. Her wing sections withstood hundreds of hours of artificial stress and vibration. Before she ever took to the air, her landing gear brought her down thousands of times on this test platform until every single landing went without a hitch. Finally, the sections were put together. The plane itself took shape. And in 1947, she was ready for her first test flight. 40,000 feet above the earth, the exhaust from her engines condenses into vapor trails that streak out proudly across the sky. This flying laboratory carried three tons of precision equipment to measure every reaction, every vibration, every small change in speed and altitude, pressure and temperature. During 250,000 miles of test flight, equal to 10 times around the world, recording instruments were under the constant scrutiny of motion picture cameras so that not a single quiver of a dial would be lost. After five million hours of design, development and testing, Boeing was ready to put the new clipper into production. Before long, her handsome figure eight cross-section began to dominate the assembly plant in Seattle as she was soon to dominate the skies. Here they were welding together a triumph of engineering and mechanics and something more, 
a plane that would provide the ultimate in comfort and safety in passenger service. That combination stemmed from close, painstaking cooperation between the manufacturer and the airline, Boeing and Pan American. Their collaboration would continue in the future. But the biggest part of their work together on the new plane was coming to an end. Now the double-decker was ready to carry passengers for Pan American World Airways, the first to order and the first to fly this great luxury liner of the air. The world's largest commercial land plane rises into the air as though she carried no weight at all. She cruises easily at 15,000 feet, while inside her cabin, altitude conditioning keeps her pressure at sea level. You may be pushing through a cloud bank three miles above the Earth, but you never feel the altitude. If you close your eyes, you might be touring along a smooth stretch of highway on the ground. With no loss in comfort for the passenger, she begins to lift herself up into the stratosphere. 15,000, 20,000, 25,000 feet, higher than any other airline. She's really in her element now, flying miles above the weather, leaving the sea of clouds below, cheating the fog and thunderstorms. While the clipper thrives in the stratosphere's clean, cold upper air, her cabin is kept at a steady, comfortable temperature. Radiant heating and air conditioning combine to maintain a constant flow of fresh air with no drafts and no chills. The clipper is at the top of her form now, moving through the stratosphere at over 300 miles an hour. Even with a flight chart before you, it's hard to realize just how fast that is. Figure it out. How long would it take to cross the Atlantic Ocean? Between dusk and dawn, less than half a day in the air, flying Pan American from New York to London. How far away is the warm sun of Brazil, the lovely city of Rio de Janeiro? Not much farther than your favorite weekend resort, flying Pan American. Between breakfast time and dinner, Pan American will carry you to the beaches of Hawaii. Traveling by clipper, a day and a night will take you across the Pacific to the Far East. As far as the traveler is concerned, of course, there are other things even more important than speed. No matter how fast you may be going, the clipper is built to give you a feeling of leisure. Flying in comfort and confidence, you've got the time and the space for a little friendly relaxation. Throughout the trip, you'll find little touches that make you feel more like a special guest than a passenger. At dinner time, a seven-course meal is served from the ship's galley the largest and most efficient flying kitchen in the world. Your dinner may be turned out with production line efficiency, but it's a meal that any housewife would be proud to serve. And you couldn't be more comfortable in your own dining room. With service like this, a trip by Pan American Clipper is something more than the shortest distance between two points. It's more than the fastest, safest way to travel. It's a pleasure in itself.
If you should feel like turning in early after dinner, you'll find none of the old problems. Your reclining chair is like a foam rubber cloud, and your neighbor's reading light is adjusted so as not to disturb your rest. The evening wears off. The bridge game has averaged over 300 miles to a rubber. And now the losers suggest that they get up and stretch their legs for a minute. You see, the clipper passenger isn't tied to his seat. There's plenty of room to move around. And for a complete change of view, you can even go downstairs. Flying five miles above the earth, you go one flight down to the clipper's lower deck lounge. Here, in a quiet, sociable atmosphere, you can take a breathing space in your trip and get to know your fellow passengers a little more informally. If you're traveling on business, you welcome the relaxation that you find here. And if you're on a holiday, a luxury like this makes the plane flight part of your vacation. You may be ending the evening with a nightcap, while above decks your berth is being made up for you. At night, many of the clipper's seats convert into wide, comfortable sleepers, and a really spacious dressing room helps you get ready for bed. Whether you're in a reclining chair, a sleeperette, or a berth, you'll sleep with the same comfort that you'd find in your own bed. And you'll sleep with confidence. You'll know that your plane's crew is always alert, working as a team to carry you safely through the night. Up front, the pace may relax for a second, but the crew's attention never leaves the control. At any moment, a glance at their instruments provides them with a complete picture, an X-ray view of every minute operation of this great plane. While you sleep, an important job is being done for you. Your stewardess is checking over your international papers, making sure that nothing will be wrong with your passport or your customs clearance when you land in the morning. She's working to save time for you. She knows that you're flying to save time for yourself. The cabin lights have been dimmed. The curtains are drawn around the berths. But the plane's crew is still working for you. For the men on the flight deck, there is no difference between day and night. Their work carries straight through, maintaining telephone communications with the ground, plotting your course and guiding your plane across the dark skies. The clipper flies on into the morning. You will be there soon. Before long, you will see the airfield rising toward you. And you will be there rested and ready for the day ahead. And because you have flown, your stay will be longer by day. Overnight, the clipper has carried you across the world to another city, another country, another continent.